Let's open to the book of Acts chapter 12. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Lord, as we look at your word this morning, breathe the breath of life upon us. In the name of Jesus Christ, speak and bless your word. That, oh God Almighty, every heart shall live here strengthened. In the name of Jesus Christ, meet us, Lord God Almighty, at the point of our individual needs. And we'll leave this place better than how we came. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. amen. My topic this morning says, the praying church. The praying church. The praying church. Acts chapter 12. Take from verse 1. I'm trying to read it very fast. Now, about that time, Herod stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him into four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending that after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But praying was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Praying was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying, Arise up quickly and his chains fell off from his hands. The power of a praying church. The power of a praying church. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Get thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. But when they were past the first and the second word, then came unto the iron gate that leaded unto the city, which opened to them of their own accord. And they went out and passed on to one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's a simple story that we all know. That Herod at some point decided to do certain wickedness to the church. He first picked James and then killed James. And when he did this thing, initially when he took James, I'm sure the church just relaxed and said, well, let's just go. Probably let's get a lawyer. Let's get people, uh, a team that will go and represent him and all of those things. And then James was killed. And Herod saw that it pleased the people. Herod here represents the enemy of the church. The church is in constant warfare. Constant warfare. And Herod went again and said, no, let's find another person. As a matter of fact, I believe the plan was let's take the one after the other. Today we kill this one, today we kill this one, and weaken the church. And they picked Peter. But this time around, something happened. That the church decided and said, no more. No more. This affliction cannot repeat itself a second time. And the Bible says that the church came together. And listen, when you read the Bible sometimes, don't question the grammar that has been used. The Bible says, and prayer was made. The Bible did not say prayer was offered. Prayer was what? Was made. There is what is called the making of prayer. All the ingredients we brought together, the mouths that prayed, the tongues that declared, the hearts that believed, the God that answered, all the ingredients we brought together and prayer was made without ceasing. And when the church comes together to pray, things happen. When the church comes together in unity to declare, ah, territories are being conquered. And that's what happened as they came together to pray. The Bible records, ah, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. They are mighty through God. They came at the church physically. They picked Peter physically. But when it was time for the church to fight back, the church had to fight back spiritually because our weapons are not carnal. And the Bible says, when this prayer was made, 
God immediately stood up. Ah, because God is waiting for your prayers. God is waiting for my prayers. Ah, God is waiting for your prayers. And my prayers, it is our prayers that moves God. And when God moves, when God moved in that case, he only told an angel, go, just one angel, and miss the security personnel, and miss the security gadget that was placed around Peter. The Bible says that the angel just went, walked past through them, because he's invisible. Our weapons are invisible. They don't see it coming. <laughs> they don't see it coming. And the angel went. The invisible angel that passed through, one would say it was a ghost. He passed through them. But when he tapped Peter, Peter felt it. Was that a ghost? <laughs> he tapped Peter and smote him. And he stood up. And he picked Peter by the hand. In Peter's mind, it's a vision. Well, let me just enjoy this lofty vision. But no! Peter's miracle was being funded by the prayers of a church. The praying church. The praying church. Beloved, if the church did not arise to pray for Peter, Peter would have been gone. The praying church. And the Bible records that the angel went hand in hand with Peter and immediately smote him. The first thing that happened was that the chains fell off his hands and his feet. He didn't use any keys. <laughs> Deliverance came with a mighty unction and power. And the angel of God picked him. And when he got to the first gate, listen, most of the technologies we see happening in the world today were technologies that God created. The Bible records that. When they got to the first gate, now what happened? The gate opened on its own accord. There are some places you go to, some big restaurants. As you're approaching, what happens? They borrowed that technology from the Bible. That's the power of prayer. That's the power of prayer. This same message is a clarion call to us as a church. Now let us awaken from our slumber. We have a responsibility. You are the testimony of our father. He stood up and missed the pain. He was making intercessions on behalf of the state. Such passion. Such passion. That's what you call the, God is, the church is called to. We are fighting against principalities and powers. We are, we, are, we are struggling. It is, it is a war in the highest realm. It is not for quick, quick, quick men. So you must guard yourself. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When I say the praying church, when we say the church, we're not talking about the buildings. We're not talking about the fans and all of these love things we're talking about. No, we're talking about you and myself. Tell your neighbor you are the church. Brosse. I need to talk, but this is what I try to. <laughs> you are the church. I am the church. The church is the ground and the pillar of truth. But listen, the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. But you and I are what makes up the church. So when I come this morning and say the praying church, I am talking to you. I'm talking to myself. There's a call for us to go back to our knees. It's a call for us to go back to our altars, to our secret places. And this is the secret. When you go back to your house, forget what happens here corporately. It helps us. But it begins from your house. When you go back to your house and you build that altar, that your praying spot, that your secret place, when you build it and you gain weight, spiritual weight there, and you grow and you expand, by the time you come to this place, he brings his fire. He brings his fire. I bring my fire. And we come together. We will cause an inferno. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man does what? A fervent man. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man, one righteous man. What happens when two righteous men come together to pray? What happens when five righteous women come together to pray? What happens when we have 50 righteous coming to pray? What happens when we have 100 righteous coming to pray? The devil cannot stop us. That is why we can say that the church is marching on and the gates of hell cannot prevail. This morning we declare under God, I stand on the authority in the name of Jesus. 
and I stand on the shoulders of my father and I declare anybody in this commission that has been earmarked for destruction by the devil as deliverance reached Peter in the prison today deliverance is reaching that person now The Bible says, even the lawful captives of the mighty shall be delivered. Meaning that even if you did what you are being accused of, but because of grace and mercy, God will still deliver you in the name of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. It doesn't matter the limitations that are placed over you. Under the unction of God in this house, I declare, today you are soaring above them. In the name of Jesus Christ. The praying church. There is power when we come together to pray. The praying church is a product of a praying people. The praying church is a product of a praying people. Sometimes when we gather to pray, you will hear the person leading, trying to say, you're not praying. Be serious. This, all of those things, it's not supposed to be. Yes, because it's what is called corporate fire. That you bring your own fire. I bring my own fire. It begins with you. So this is a challenge to your personal prayer life. Beloved, we live in critical times. We live in critical times. Times when people leave their houses and they don't know what to expect. With all due respect, the governments of the day that are failing us. The economy is failing us. Everything is failing us. There is fear in the atmosphere. Just the other day, Iran had the guts to attack Israel. And the other day, I heard there's a retaliation. There is rumors of wars everywhere. We are approaching the end time. And listen, you need to build your own personal altar because prayer gives you stability. When you wait on the Lord, you have stability. The Bible talks about the peace which surpasses human understanding. That was what Jesus Christ had, that whilst he was in the boat, the winds were tossing up and down, puff, 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 puff. but the man was darkening and was sleeping. The peace that surpasses human understanding. Our father told us one time he was in a flight, I think with mommy or so, and there was turbulence. Oh my God. Have you been in a flight and there's turbulence? I have been. It's not funny. It is sweet to talk now. But he, he slept off. The peace that does not make sense. You cannot explain it. How? A flight? How many thousand feet above? But daddy is sleeping. These kinds of realms, you can only get them when you have built your altar. And you've gotten to a point where you know that you are an investment to God and you cannot suffer defeat. There are some people that cannot die anyhow. Hi, no now. You mean God will come and invest in you and say that He has a plan for you? He says so time and time, and you go out, motor will knock you down. Or you're in a airplane. No, 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 it cannot happen. Because God is the best businessman I've ever seen. How do I know? When they made the parables, He gave this one, two, five, and all of those things. The guy that did not bring returns on investment, God punished him. <laughs> So God will not invest in you and allow you to suffer defeat or allow you to fail. You cannot die. So the best prayer you can pray is, Father, in your plan for this world and for the kingdom to go, come, give me a place, a little place. No matter how small, Lord, even make me the footmat. Make me the footmat. When you're part of God's plan, nothing can cut short your life. You have eternal insurance. You've not heard testimonies of servants of God. Sometimes it happens. God forbid. Everybody goes. They come out on scratch. Because heaven cannot suffer loss. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, the question now becomes, what then is prayer? Ah, Richard, what are you saying? This is elementary now. Yes. Let's do elementary teaching. What then is prayer? There are so many definitions of prayers, but I choose the simplest one. Prayer, simply, is communication with God. As simple as it sounds, I will show to us that many of us have not really gotten it right. Prayer is what? Communication with God. 
it means that it is a two-way channel. I've used it too much, sorry. <laughs> it means that it is a two-way channel. Now, when I speak to this person who are communicating, what do I expect from this person? Response or feedback. <laughs> but some of us, it's not like that. We have turned God to transactional God. As a matter of fact, we even coined a phrase called prayer request. <laughs> that all what is all what we are interested in eh, is the hands of God. We just come to God to ask, Lord, give me, Lord, give me, Lord, give me, Lord, I want, Lord, provide, Lord, meet me at the point of my needs. And we never wait to pay attention to hear what God has to say. Communication with God is a two way channel. Is there anything wrong with me asking God for things? No. After all, God instructed us in Matthew 7 7, He said, Ask and it shall be given unto you. But listen, God wants to be more than a giver to you. God wants to be more than a supplier to you. Ah, we have limited our relationships with God. To just requesting, asking, asking. There is something that God desires from us that is deeper than that. When I saw it in the Bible, I was shocked. God is all powerful. God has a clean record. He has never failed. He will never change. You see, He called those things that be not as and they become. If God comes here now and says this thing is a green pool, and before you think of doubting, this thing becomes a green pool. The integrity of God has never been questioned. That's why he says, when I send forth my word, it must fulfill that which is being sent for. It doesn't return void. And then, I see a place in the Bible that shows me that as vast, as rich as God is, God is constantly looking for a set of people. God is constantly recruiting he is searching to and fro the earth, looking for a particular group of people. And I'm saying, God, can't you just create this book for yourself? No. God doesn't work like that. He is constantly looking for a group of people. How do I know? When Jesus Christ was talking with the woman at the well, the Bible says that Jesus Christ told the woman and said, He said, Ye worship what ye know that what ye know not. And then he said that. He said that. God seeketh those who will worship him how? In spirit and in truth. Eh? It means that when God comes to a service like this, eh, he's not looking for who shouts the most. <laughs> he's not looking for who is screaming the most. No. He's looking for the category of people who is giving him worship in spirit and in truth. So you must build yourself where? That takes me to the next point. The power of the quiet time. It is in the place of a quiet time that you begin to build and develop yourself. The Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world. Listen, when you become born again, it is not your pastor's responsibility to make you grow. It is your responsibility. You must desire through learning, study the word of God, and listen, the quiet time affords you this opportunity. We live in a world that everything is fast food. The world of today, we are on the fast lane. Everything is done fast. There is fast food. There is fast everything. Right now, even for the young people, there is fast marriage. Ask me how. We have what is called dating apps. If you know, let me see your hand. You will not raise up your hand. There are dating apps. Now what happens is that you just go, you just key in your likes and your dislikes, the kind of man you want, the kind of woman you want. See it in, poof. They will match you. They call, it's called matchmaking. They will match you, one, two, three, bam, you got a match. That's the world we find ourselves. Everything is on the go. And it has affected the spiritual lives of Christians. That even Christians are falling for this now. When last did you wake up and you went on your knees by your bedside and began to worship God? 
Christians even wake up nowadays and the first thing they stretch for are their phones. Some people even stretch for their phones. You are not even sure if your eyes will open first. You are not even sure if your legs can carry you. You want your phone. I need a phone room. Take my phone. That's the first thing you're thinking of. And as you're picking that phone, it is so serious. And for those that even have small conscience left, as you pick the phone, you just go straight to WhatsApp. Did she answer? Did she answer? Hey, oh, I've not prayed. Father, in the name of Jesus. Hello, hello, sir. Yes, I'm in prayers. Yes. After prayers, I'll call you back. Are you even serious? The person that even tell that kind of thing, they say, this person must be a joker. God desires our attention. God, he says, my son, give me your heart. It is our heart that God is after. Let's stop commercializing God and prayers. Let's give God our heart. Have your quiet time. Go on your knees in the morning. Appreciate God first for the gift of life. Don't you ever get to the point where you take for granted the air you breathe. People are paying for it. That your legs can carry you is a big miracle. That you woke up, the songwriter says, clothed in my right senses, it's a miracle. That you woke up by yourself. You took yourself to your door. You opened your door. They didn't come to break down the door to bring you out. It's a miracle. Let's stop turning God into give me this. I want this. I want this. When God wants our heart. Beloved, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We have placed things wrongly. It is when you seek God first with your whole heart and God comes upon you and into you, you will not make certain prayer requests because you will take your needs as his needs. The quiet time, that's all we talk about, is fine. The quiet time, God desires fellowship with us. But you must train yourself to know when God speaks. The Bible says the boy Samuel was under tutelage with Eli and was sleeping. And God came in the middle of the night. God always comes in the middle of the night. In the cool of the evening. When men are sleeping, destinies are being made. And it was time for the next dispensation of God. God came to the boy and stood beside him and said, Samuel, Samuel. And because the boy hadn't an experience, he didn't know what that was. He hadn't started having quiet time. So it was a strange voice. He thought, oh, that must be my, my master. And he stood up and he ran. I said, my Lord, you call me. Eli was already old and tired. What's wrong with this boy? Who's calling by this time? Please, go back to your room. I'm sleeping. And God must have laughed and said, ah, don't worry. You will grow. <laughs> and he's patient with us. God he is patient with us. He treats all of us on a face by face level. He's <laughs> impartial. And God came again and said, Samuel, Samuel. And the boy stood up. Ah. And he went and said, Ah, my master, you called again. And I said, I did not call you. But then thank God for the wisdom of the old. He said, No, come. Go and lie down. When you hear that voice again, answer, speak, Lord. Thy servant here. Eli was talking from the place of experience. What's your experience in the place of prayer? Because Eli knew that God will always come like that. And then when God came the third time and said, Samuel, Samuel, ha, ah, the boy got it. He said, Yes, Lord, speak thy servant here. That is what happens in your quiet time. You hear our father. Our father will speak. And sometimes you hear him is accurate with the dates, with the month. He will tell you on such and so day, in such and so month, such and so year. God told me this. These things don't happen here. It happens in the secret place. He that dwelleth in the secret place. 
Where is your secret place? What is your secret place? It is in the place of your quiet time that God will release to you the blueprint of your life. Ah, it is there that God will tell you. God will show you your, the picture of your future. So that even when you're going through the fires and you're going through the flood, you will say, God, this was not how it's going to end. Though. This is not how you showed me. This wasn't what you showed me. You showed me a glorious high throne. You said I'll be up there. I can't end here. Let's go back to our quiet times. Let's go and seek God first for ourselves. I used to tell my class that your actions and inactions have a direct consequence on your generations unborn. Meaning, the things you do or the things that you should do that you're not doing will have a direct consequence on your unborn generation. The Bible says, that God sent a prophet to the house and called his name Saul and said, Saul, you're going to be the first king of Israel. Saul was handed over on a platter of gold, a royal lineage. <laughs> but because of his actions of disobedience, he lost it. Because of that, his entire lineage was plunged into poverty. So the things that you're doing now, the things that you're supposed to do that you're not doing, they will have a direct consequence upon your children unborn. Some fathers laid up curses for their children because of what they did. Other fathers, they laid up blessings. That they come and say, what are you, what's, your name? what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? You say who? Who? You say who? Richard Okoro. Oh. Ah, it's my father. Come, 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 come. People's names have opened doors for their children when they were long gone. Because of the deeds they did whilst they were alive. Be careful what you sow. It is not only you that will reap it. Your children will reap it. When you have opportunity to do good to people, don't withhold it. Don't. There are many people in places of power and authority and they are blinded first to the people that they know. Ah, sister, sister. It's me, this is him. Oh, nobody heard you. But God saw you. God heard you. Listen, get to the point where you know that any position that God has placed you is not for yourself. It's not for yourself. Ah, <laughs> Esther said, who knows? That God sent me here to this kingdom for such a time like this. The deliverance was it for Esther? It was not. It was not. So I challenge us this morning as I summarize. It is time for us to go back to our secret place. There is what God wants to do in your life. Stop going to God in prayers and after sending, you don't go to hear from God. God wants to talk to you. God desires koinonia, fellowship with you. That's what God desires. God desires to walk with you hand in hand. God desires to follow you. God wants to be part of your everyday activities. Don't do like some people. That you only call certain people when you have certain needs. So much so that when they see your phone, your number ring, they say, ah, I'm not you. That's how most of us treat God. Treat God when we're at the crossroads of life. That's what we remember God. But that's not what God desires. God wants to walk with us hand in hand, side by side. Hand in hand, side by side. Hand in hand, side by side. There's a thing that God has designed for you. Let's be on our feet. There is something that God has designed for you. There's a blessing that God has designed for you. There's a gift that God has designed for you. There's a blessing that God has packaged with your name on it. There is a testimony that has your name on it. But listen, that testimony eh, can only be brought from the spiritual realm to the physical realm through the tool of prayer. So there's a clarion call to each and every one of us this morning to go back to our altars. To go back to our altars. To go back, Preston, please come up. To go back to our altars. We have to go back to our altars. We're going to pray this morning and say, Father, I must have wandered away like the prodigal son. 
The distractions of life must have tossed me and have left my altar. Ah, for some of us, there is dust on our altars. For some of us, there are cobwebs, the spider webs on our altar. Ah, for some of us, the fire is gone. But this morning, God is saying, if you just God open your heart and believe, I will light up that altar again with fire. <sighs> Lift up your hands in God's presence this morning. Lift up your hands in God's presence this morning. I don't know what you heard this morning. I don't know what you heard. 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 Oh Lord Father, I am back. I am back. I had wandered far away. I had gone far from you. I heard your voice. I still did not want to come. I wandered far away. Lord, because of that, my altar has become cold. I've become lukewarm. You are about to spew me out, but Lord, have mercy. I have come back to your presence. I have come back to your presence. Lord, I make a vow this morning that, oh God Almighty, just light your fire on my heart again. Revive your fire on my heart again. Revive your fire on my heart again. Rekindle the passion of prayer in my heart. Rekindle the passion of prayer in my heart. Make me a praying man. Make me a praying woman. Make me a praying boy. Lord, make me a praying child. Make me carry fire. Lord Jesus Christ, I want my life to count for you. I want my life to count for you. Lord God Almighty, spark your light in me. Cause me to be fire. That, oh God Almighty, I shall, oh God, wherever I go to, I shall light up men for you. I shall light up men for you. I shall be a carrier. I will say, oh God, your fire. I will light up men. Jesus Christ, Lord, do this work in me. Do do this walk in me. Do this walk in me. Do this walk in me. Oh Lord, 